Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Enabling the Next Generation Digital Front Door Strategy, Effective Mobile Patient Engagement Strategies to Improve Access and Quality of Care. I am Brian Zimmerman with Becker's Hospital Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Noel Kershukani is the Vice President for Allscripts Consumer Innovation, Follow My Health. Noel is a seasoned healthcare executive leader adding to Follow My Health over 20 years of valuable experience in digital consumer engagement and provider solutions. He brings an extensive background in leading operational teams and collaborating with C-level executives and multiple healthcare stakeholders, including health systems, provider groups, HIT vendors, health plans, and pharma organizations. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Noel to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon and good morning to all of you that have joined us here today. Uh, very happy Tuesday and excited to be walking through uh, some of the elements of building a next generation digital front door strategy. During today's webinar, we're going to cover quite a bit, uh, but I'm hoping that some of this is going to be a bit obvious, some of it a bit enlightening, and some of it that would give you an ability to put uh, action to plan. With that being said, just a few things that I plan to cover in today's webinar. Um, the first is, as everyone knows, we're moving into a much more consumer-centric uh, industry. And one of the things that we want to look to cover here is what is driving some of the more patient engagement and digital front door decisions uh, that are being made across health systems, providers, and many other healthcare organizations today. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the competitive space and the drivers from that angle as well. And above and beyond that, we want to talk about some of the elements and components that make up a solid strategy and moving forward and executing upon a plan of action to introduce new patient engagement technologies. With all that, all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. I don't think it's any secret to anyone uh, that we are moving into an age of consumerism, in particular, uh, in this healthcare industry. Um, as you probably all know, all of us are already consumers, and we live in an on-demand economy. More often than not, we find ourselves transacting on the one thing that is always on, their, on our person, and that is our mobile device, whether it is ordering something from Amazon, whether it is uh, banking with my, my typical bank, uh, whether I'm ordering something on HBO Go or Netflix. I'm leveraging now uh, my mobile technology as an opportunity to transact very quickly, very conveniently. If I look at today, even now, uh, we see restaurant industry, hospitality, uh, even opportunities across multiple industries that connect with you via things like text notifications and giving you pathways that enable you to essentially establish a call to action, but also perform that call to action. As we all know, the healthcare industry has lagged somewhat behind in being able to introduce these types of capabilities. But more recently, we're starting to see a lot more movement towards introducing self-service technologies via mobile that really provide more ownership and ability to the consumer than ever before. In knowing that we live in this on-demand economy, uh, already studies are showing that consumers as patients are really looking to start to transact with their healthcare provider in a digital environment. It's rare now that we see ourselves answering the phones like we used to. Oftentimes, if it's a number that I personally don't, don't know or, or don't really recognize, I probably wouldn't pick up the phone. But more often than not, if I know that I have an opportunity to either on my own transact via a mobile app and or be provided with some sort of a notification, a push alert, or some other mechanism that tells me what I need to do in my healthcare journey, and it's told to me by my own provider or somebody that's personal, I have a higher probability that I will actually do that call to action. And so what we're finding more and more in this industry is an opportunity 
by which we can not only be allow for proactive from the patient calls to action, but actually be proactive as health systems and providers to navigate patients across their health system environment and across their care journey. With that being said, are we really fundamentally prepared for this shift in consumerism? Over the last several years, I've had a unique opportunity to work with a vast majority of health system and provider organizations. Uh, some of the key things that I've heard over the last several years, uh, number one is no longer can we really rely on the traditional monolithic portal solutions that we had originally thought of over a decade ago. Now it's a strategic imperative for us as a health system to become part of the fabric of the consumer and the patient's everyday life and everyday interaction. Similarly, another health system CEO had said something very interesting to me. He said, today, we compete very differently than how we did many years ago. It's not so much about quality. Being in healthcare, we all inherently are driven to provide quality care. Today, to compete, to drive patients back to my network, it's about providing access, simplifying that access, and when I've provided that access, giving that patient, as a consumer, the best possible experience with my organization. And that is what keeps them coming back. Something, and one final note here, something that I heard from a recent CMIO, uh, which really hit home for me and really has led to one of those competitive drivers that I'm about to talk about. He says, in the next five to 10 years, we are less com concerned about the traditional competitors that we have come to know over the last several years that we know down the street. Our concern is what's coming down the pipe in terms of market disruptors. Organizations like Amazon and CBS, Aetna, Google, who quite frankly, not only have disruptive business models, but more fundamentally have known and learned how to connect and engage with the consumer for the last decade. It's a very enlightening note, especially when you start to look at some of the studies that have come out recently as most recent surveys. It seems to echo very clearly that a lot of our health system and provider organizations are a little bit concerned over the next five years about these new potential competitors and how they have fundamentally established a deep, meaningful connection with their consumers that keeps them coming back with a high degree of meaningful experiences. So as we start to turn the page and we start to see health systems looking to introduce new models of access, new digital entry points, there are some very specific areas by which they can anchor themselves uh, in establishing these meaningful strategies. Clearly, one of the key areas that many organizations are starting to focus on is leveraging mobile. Uh, in the mobile environment, there is an opportunity for us to engage with that individual at the, one, at the right time, at any time, at the right place, as well as at the right time in their own journey. And in, in doing that, it allows us to create or establish quite a bit of interactions that are more specific to calls to action with that individual. Rather than providing, like our traditional monolithic patient portals, uh, a vast array of information, we now have an opportunity to establish very digestible chunks of calls to action and notifications that help to drive the patient at the right time across their care. We believe over the next several years, the leveraging and utilization of mobile technologies will clearly become much more important. But how we actually engage with the patient on their mobile device might be more important than just producing another mobile app that the patient has to download or put directly onto their phone. So let's look at some of the ways that we may be thinking about or introducing more mobile-based technologies to engage the individual.
as we start to put together a strategy that makes sense for an organization, especially as it relates to establishing a quote unquote digital front door, it always is important to kind of start with the end in mind. What are some of the key areas of impact that we want to establish for our health system, our provider organization, uh, whoever that organization might be? As we look out into the industry, there are some clear areas of impact that we are recognizing. One of the biggest trends is acquisition, attraction, and retention of patients. As we talked about earlier, with a competitive environment becoming even more competitive with market disruptors, it's becoming much more important for these organizations to understand how to establish a single thread to that particular individual that attracts them and keeps them leveraging the services within their own organization. More importantly, post follow-up or post service is identifying ways that we continue to remain engaged outside of the four walls of our hospital, of our provider organization, and essentially become part of that individual's everyday life. Secondarily um, is the patient experience. How can we start to leverage these innovations and technologies to number one, identify areas of improvement in patient experience, and then number two, leverage that data and leverage that intelligence to fully improve upon that experience and do that in real time or near real time. The third and final area of impact is how we can improve patient navigation and patient flow. Again, a lot of times as we start to move through our healthcare journey, identifying the right area to interact and identifying the right care environment to move to can be a little bit of a daunting task. But by introducing technology that essentially allows us to define the pathway for that patient will certainly change the game in navigating patients back to and within the health system network or provider network that I am most familiar with and accustomed to. With that being said, there are some objectives, as I like to consider, in establishing these types of strategies and establishing a digital front door that tracks to these areas of impact. First off, understanding the business drivers. Uh, what are some of these drivers that are really going back to aligning with my um, areas of impact? First off, many, many folks are trying to still focus on regulatory improvement. And so where can I start to leverage technology to increase utilization of things like just reviewing my clinical record or clinical care summaries or responding to a gap in care that I can close gap, that I can very quickly schedule my appointment and close that gap or responding to assessments around patient experience so that I can improve things like HCAP surveys and other required regulatory and or incentive-based opportunities that are relevant and meaningful to my health system or provider organization. Some of the core requirements also need to be taken into account. Things like integration to existing workflow and integration to existing operations because clearly as we start to introduce new self-service opportunities and patient-facing opportunities, the efficiencies that we want to gain in that introduction will also translate to how we start to transform the organization and the staff workflows that once did that manually. We'll also want to evaluate uh, other requirements related to that digital front door. Do we want to introduce more of a push to this particular patient as opposed to uh, a methodology where the patient, where we're reliant or dependent on the patient to come to our digital front door every single time. Should we be interacting on many devices, a single device? What is the channel at which I want to basically uh, interact with this individual? And then finally, what are the opportunities to consolidate technology? What we've learned over the last several years is that patients, just like our providers, uh, get lost in the sea of technology. 
it's important for us to introduce a singular thread, one methodology, one mechanism that the patient becomes familiar with. And in doing so, we want to be able to look at opportunities to consolidate that footprint so that the patient essentially knows exactly how they will continue to navigate with our organization. Finally, as we start to introduce all of these digital experiences, we also want to be able to capture the context of every one of those interactions. Because what we know within organizations is that it isn't going to be always that the patient will leverage their mobile phone in order to do everything that they can do. In some instances, they still need to make a phone call to the call center or the practice or the hospital, in which case you want to be mindful and you want to be cognizant that those, these types of interactions are captured holistically so that staff members across the organization have complete visibility in everything that is happening with the patient, no matter what the channel. With that being said, let's talk a little bit about what has not worked and what we're seeing as being very successful. I don't think it's any secret to anyone that our traditional monolithic ways of interacting with the patient through the patient portal have clearly fallen a little bit short. With the industry averages running about at best 20 to 25 to 30% adoption, at worst sometimes 5%, it's left a lot of organizations wondering, how do I truly engage with the remaining 80, 90% of the population that's out there, that's not using my patient portal? And so right out of the gate, it is imperative for organizations to be thinking about how do we start to create models that will eliminate barriers to adoption and utilization of technology. The second sort of area that we have found over the last several years is that we are seeing a move from what used to be a strategy of introducing multiple disparate point-based solutions and technologies to the patient to one that is more focused on reducing and consolidating those technologies under a true platform play. Now, let's talk a little bit about that because I think it's really important. If you look at the landscape of what a patient sees today, this little slide probably looks pretty familiar. A patient is literally bombarded with multiple types of technologies that they have to deal with across their healthcare journey. A different technology solution uh, for scheduling a different one for appointment confirmations that is reaching out to them. They have to go to a different portal to, for preoperative prep uh, and pre-admission pre tasking. They have a different bill pay uh, 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 place that they have to go to or website that they have to go to just to pay their bills. By the end of it, they're touching multiple technologies none of which are really even integrated the way that, that we want them to across a journey or across an experience. And at the end of it becomes very daunting for that particular organization. It is our belief that the digital front door is really about introducing a platform-based experience, one that not only navigates the patient to where they need to be or what they need to do, but actually provides them with the appropriate pathway to perform that particular call to action right in that sitting. In order to do that, it, it really is dependent upon and predicated upon removing the point-based methodology and being able to introduce a much more platform-based experience. We see this already today in other industries. For example, uh, if you go to your bank, uh, you don't have a separate technology for your savings account and then a separate technology uh, or portal for your checking account. Everything is in one specific sitting. We also believe that in healthcare, that is the model that will be very relevant to the consumer and the patient. The second I mentioned earlier is removing sort of the original 
model of the traditional patient portal experience and taking a much more proactive, mobile-first approach. Earlier, I'd shown a slide about the acceleration of mobile use. And more and more, we're finding that populations from seniors to millennials are leveraging smartphone technology to engage and interact more frequently, and more importantly, transact more frequently across multiple verticals. We need to be able to live within that similar kind of workflow. And as a result, increase that type of utilization beyond that 10, 15, 20% threshold that we have grown accustomed to see from the traditional portal methodology. All that being said, from a digital front door experience, we also need to understand that not every single patient will have a traditional smartphone device. And so we have to be prepared for the multiple channels that can be easily accessed or be provided or exposed to that individual. And so it isn't just about the mobile environment, it's also being able to do things like automated voice messaging, uh, being able to introduce chatbot and text messaging, standard email, sometimes still highly utilized. And at the end of the day, introducing an omni-channel experience by which that individual is most accustomed to. With that being said, let's touch on each one of these components. First off, we talked about this earlier. As a best practice, we have found the most successful organizations are truly beginning to introduce much more platform-based experiences. As you can kind of see on your screen, uh, one of the things that we've, we've identified, especially with organizations we work with, is they offer multiple use cases, multiple interactions via the same methodology every single time, whether it is a gap in care that needs to be responded to, whether it is an appointment reminder, whether it is providing them with educational content, or if it is providing them with things like scheduling as well as electronic check-in. There should be multiple capabilities that are easily accessed by that particular consumer. Now, what's important here is that there are a lot of different technologies in this space that will introduce, quote unquote, outreach capabilities. It's no secret that you know, campaign management is becoming much more prevalent. But our belief is that the digital front door is more than just about outreaching or notifying a patient. It's really about ensuring that that patient as a consumer completes the transaction that we need them to do at that moment in time. So there are two parts or objectives in this strategy. Number one is notifying the patient, the individual, of that particular opportunity in the campaign, and then secondarily giving them a mechanism that allows them to do or perform that particular campaign right in the same sitting. So as an example, if I sent a gap in care to a patient, uh, maybe they're due for a flu shot or an annual well, I don't just want to tell them that they're due for that. I need to provide them with a mechanism to have that scheduled or that service scheduled. Whether it's linking them off to a scheduling environment where they can do a self-service service scheduling opportunity, or if it's as simple as providing them with a single click to call through the text message that tells them, hey, or dials them out to that provider organization where they can, the staff can schedule that appointment right in that city. So it's, again, it's more than just presenting the call to action. It's giving them a platform approach that allows them to perform that call to action. With that being said, you're going to find, uh, particularly with the Follow My Health side of the platform or of this uh, experience, that we've introduced a very similar set of capabilities. Here, again, a best practice we have found that there is a, a very unique way that you can activate patients via text. More and more, patients are becoming very accustomed and uh, very used to leveraging text capabilities as the way to interact. 
So in this particular light, we leverage a couple of different capabilities. Number one is we eliminate the barriers that have traditionally been there of things like having a mobile app on your phone. Oftentimes we find more and more that patients really don't want to have another app uh, on their phone. That real estate on that phone is incredibly meaningful to them. And so if 50% of them download the app and the remaining 50% delete it in the next 30 days, I have no way of reconnecting with that individual. But if I can continue to send a basic text notification that comes from their own personal connection with their provider, there's a higher probability that I can actually go through and have that patient complete that call to action. And I apologize, my, my screen seems to be moving on its own, so uh, let me bring this back here. In this particular model, we leverage a, a way that the patient can receive that call to action via text, a little link discrete to their phone, and then rather than having to download any app, go to the app store or anything along those lines, it's simply a push web experience through the browser of their mobile device. Also, to eliminate the barriers to adoption, we remove the traditional mechanism of username and password. Because as we've learned over the years, uh, oftentimes patients forget what their username and password was. I sure do. And then you end up, as an organization, getting all those phone calls, uh, and that becomes a very daunting experience in and of itself. But by establishing a different multi-factor authentication mechanism, I can very easily notify the patient and then allow them a, a place to where I can get them to perform the call to action that is being requested, whether it is scheduling, whether it is to check in for an appointment that has been already set up, even if it's as simple as reviewing a clinical care summary uh, post-care. These are all, again, the same set of experiences, the same methodology that the patient becomes familiar with and accustomed to, making it very, very easy to adopt and utilize as time uh, goes on. This is a little bit of an example of the design of an experience. Again, as we start to introduce a mobile platform as well as, again, a platform-based experience, it gives us a unique opportunity to define what the journey of that patient would be and what some of those interactions should be along the journey. On your screen, you're seeing a concept that we've seen time and time again called the wheel. Um, essentially, it is an opportunity to say or define what are the interactions that I should be sending to this patient at, across this particular type of journey. We may be proactive and identify either through our platform or through a population health analytics tool that, for example, this patient is due for an annual well or whatever, whatever that service type might be. The patient can receive an opportunity to schedule that appointment right on their mobile phone inside of a three to five minute time period, have them do it right then and there. However it gets in, we may send them reminders the exact same way, a little text notification just to confirm they're coming in, provide them with education to prep them for the visit that's about to occur. And rather than how we used to see patients coming into the practice or coming into the organization and having to check in on tablets that are foreign to them, why wouldn't we take a little lesson from the airline industry and have them check in right on their mobile phone, sign any forms that they need to sign, have them fill out any assessments that are required before they arrive. That gives us not only a better experience for the patient prior to arrival, but it allows health system organizations to even change the experience for at the, at the practice or health system when the patient arrives. I think about it a lot like how Ritz-Carlton has done it over the last several years, capturing several points of information about who you are, what visit that you currently, or what you're doing during your visit here, what you're interested in, so that when I arrive, my entire vacation, my entire stay with that organization is completely planned for me, and they already know 
what my expectations are. Rather than just focusing on access here in this first phase, we want to continue the journey. If, if I'm all about retaining that particular patient, the experience after care is just as important as what happens before and during. And so we find that having the sort of this platform approach gives you an opportunity to introduce transactional opportunities even after care, making sure they receive the up-to-date care summary, that they're presented with a way to be referred to the appropriate downstream provider, whether it's the cardiologist, the radiology uh, center, or whatever they need to do post-care within your network, and then again, following up on that patient's progress across their care plan, all of which we find today are traditionally either phone-based mechanisms. We can now take to much more push experiences to the patient and still be able to capture the relevant interactions that have occurred. The same can be said for the acute experience. I bring this up because this is also very vital to the digital front door concept. At the end of the day, the patient should not care what type of care environment I'm going to. The experience says should be the same for me, whether I'm going into an ambulatory care setting, whether I'm moving into a more of an acute-based or procedural acute setting or an episodic setting, or even if I need to uh, establish some sort of a telehealth visit. I shouldn't have multiple points of entry necessarily. I should have one singular set of experiences that I become accustomed to and drive to uh, regardless of the care environment. And so you'll find we also introduce a layer of interactions across the acute space, pre and post care, but then also introduce the same methodologies to capture experiences while the patients and family members are at bedside. We may offer up uh, questions uh, as to how their experiences have been since they, have been in, uh, since they have been in our hospital. We may provide them with educational opportunities or information about their existing stay, all of which set the stage for an improvement in the experience so that when they leave the hospital, they feel like they were cared for, they feel like their experience was highly satisfactory, and they know that they can, they can feel good about coming back to our organization for similar services should it need be uh, in the future. Now, we've touched on quite a bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about strategy execution enablement. We have talked more uh, holistically as of right now as to what are some of the calls to action that we need to be thinking about? What are some of the areas of impact? What are some of the ways we want to establish a digital front door? And how do we leverage mobile experiences in order to do that. Now the question is, if we believe in that platform approach, if we believe in a mobile first approach, how do we execute upon this strategy? What are the things we can be mindful of as we start to transform our organization to introduce more consumer-centric uh, capabilities? Let's start with what a lot of the health systems we work with have found, and that is, Within their own organizations, there's quite a bit of existing point-based technologies, some of which are overlapping in many larger organizations. And so what we find is that there is a bottom line effort that you can begin to think about where if I needed to, I can start to consolidate multiple experiences, beginning with the easiest ones first, uh, as a pathway to introducing a platform approach. Now, one of the things that we find is that from an adoption perspective with the patient population, the simplest transactions are a good place to start, especially if I'm introducing things like text notifications, uh, because at the end of the day, over the last several years, patients have always received things like appointment confirmations. They've become accustomed to it. But it also becomes, if you choose to go down this path, sort of a Trojan horse. What if I could introduce the exact same text capability as, a, as an appointment confirmation 
for every single type of interaction I need them to do. Now it becomes one pathway, one way that that patient will automatically know they'll be notified and can perform a specific call to action. So here, once I've introduced or consolidated very simplified experiences, I can now start to introduce more complex capabilities. Could be things like uh, mobile and online scheduling. Could be things like mobile-based check-in experiences in that include things like uh, photo capture of insurance cards, QR codes, uh, so on and so forth. Could be even going the distance with care management, uh, where if I know this patient is a joint replacement patient or a heart failure patient, I have them on a 90 to 120 day care plan, but I want to monitor their progress, I might want to introduce a little assessment just to manage or monitor how they're feeling or how they are progressing along their care plan. You can essentially start to enable interactions along this particular implementation path and ensure that you retain a high degree of adoption by the population uh, as you move forward in that strategy. Another way to look at this particular execution is what we talked about before, those areas of impact. A lot of organizations think about it as top-line growth. A lot of, from, from the last couple of years, we've seen an explosion in patient acquisition methods. Um, and so what we know is that most recently, we're seeing more interactions that introduce things like mobile and online scheduling, uh, campaign outreach capabilities, opportunities that essentially drive patients back into service offerings that are available within my network. Certainly, uh, a very valuable way to introduce new technology and a very valuable way to actually meet those areas of impact right out of the gate. Again, our finding, keep in mind that our finding has been that successful implementations have always started with very simplified mechanisms. Um, things that the consumer, particularly in healthcare, have already grown accustomed to. By introducing some of those pathways very quickly and very early, you can ensure that you've acquired those patients into that modality and then layer on newer and enable newer interactions over time that keeps them fully engaged across the care journey. Now, a couple of other things that are really worth um, kind of thinking through here. Uh, again, I talked about this before is uh, interactions also need to make sure that we are fully integrated, not just with core technologies and core systems, but also with core operations. Uh, what we find is that a lot of times you lose a lot of staff buy-in if the, the, there's a disjointedness in how patients respond and how staff intervenes or responds in kind. So more often than not, we find having that integration path and an intervention path between clinician, care manager, front desk staff member, and the patient is extremely vital uh, in this particular uh, development. And so as you go through and execute upon your strategy, ensuring that there is a proper workflow and a proper set of data points that can be pulled and pushed directly to your core systems will be incredibly vital to the implementation process as well. Finally, as you go through the process of introducing these new technologies, it is vital that those areas of impact we just discussed have very discrete ROI metrics and benchmarks that you can anchor yourself around. And so at the end of the day, it has to be more than just about introducing the technology in the space. It's also about being able to analyze the utilization of those technologies so that you can further refine and establish more optimal experiences with the patient population and for the patient population that also track back to improvements for your own organization. We find that introducing an analytics uh, sort of part of the platform you can start to look at how, do we de how are we decreasing gaps in care in this particular modality? Uh, how are we uh, improving on our no-show rates? 
How are we improving on collection rates? Every single use case that you choose to introduce to your patient population should carry with it a set of ROI metrics and benchmarks that enable you to ensure that you are getting the kind of success out of this execution the way that you had expected. With that being said, um, there's a couple of different ROI analytics that we ourselves even focus on. Um, as an example, over our history, we found that this text-based and uh, push-based methodology has resulted in things like 30 to 40 percent in gap and care closures. This is actually a very interesting finding because sometimes it's not even about introducing a scheduling component. It's just about creating visibility to the patient population. And in, in doing that, giving them a simple phone number back to their own provider that enables them to schedule an appointment that should have been done probably 12 months ago. So if, if we introduce very simplified interactions, we know that there is real return on investment that can be garnered from a simplified interaction like this. In addition to that, we can still move beyond the traditional patient portal experiences and ensure that we meet a lot of the regulatory requirements for MIPS, MACRA, and, and uh, meaningful use. In our world, what we found is that if you deconstruct the concept of having patients going to a traditional patient portal experience, but you start to introduce a methodology that pushes it uh, or pushes care summaries, pushes that information to the patient, there's a higher probability you can get that patient to review their clinical care summary, act upon any referrals that are required, and thereby actually start to increment measures that are relevant to any type of regulatory or value-based type of initiative. Finally, uh, very specific interactions and calls to action like mobile and online check-in that have been around for quite a while, those themselves even experience a lift in adoption and utilization by having a platform-based set of experiences. If I know that as a patient, I'm going to receive an appointment confirmation four days from my appointment, that I'm going to receive education two days from my appointment, then I'm going to receive a mobile check-in experience 24 hours, now I have my journey laid out for me. I know what to expect. And in that process, as I go through a mobile check-in experience, I know I can get this completed now rather than having to fill out a bunch of paperwork when I arrive at the practice. Again, changing the experience both pre and point of care so that the patient has feels like that particular service and that particular opportunity is high quality and very personalized. With all that being said, there are numerous examples, I think, that we find in our healthcare industry of organizations that have done it well. Uh, and I think you'll find that when we say that success hasn't just been about standing up technology, it's also about how well it's been adopted. Uh, a lot of these organizations have been highly awarded and highly regarded for uh, some of those, those implementations. Case in point, Nicholas Children's uh, down in Miami, Florida, one of the foremost pediatric institutions um, out there. Uh, when we first started with that particular organization, their organization really was challenged with uh, engaging both patients and family members. And when, you, when they thought about the population that they serve in particular, they very quickly realized that it was most important to bypass the traditional portal mechanism, but start to introduce more mobile-based capabilities that interact with those particular patients and family members. And as a result, they were able to see their engagement rates go from what was originally 2% to roughly 80 to 90%. Even today, there is less than a 3% opt-out rate of these notifications from their organization. Over 97% of the population receives their discharge summaries on their mobile phone. More importantly, they've been able to take a lot of these experiences and now move themselves to a more wireless type of an environment in totality, not just within the provider organization. Just recently, they were actually awarded Chime's Most uh, Wired Hospital Award just, this, just most recently. And they've garnered over seven 
to one ROI in leveraging a lot of these capabilities. Community Health Systems, another organization, one of the largest uh, in the United States, has leveraged this type of technology across multiple regions and multiple markets, allowing patients to do things like schedule appointments on their mobile phone when it's required, uh, review their care summaries on demand, uh, post-visit, and even uh, be provide, or provide their patients with uh, referral opportunities once they've been discharged from the hospital, navigating them back to their own primary care physician network where it was necessary. All of these interactions have resulted in quite a significant return on investment, but also a vast consolidation of their technology footprint to where patients are now leveraging one conduit uh, the entire, throughout their entire journey. And of course, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health, where in initially, uh, you know, there was a challenge with trying to get patients just to leverage the traditional portal experience in order to review care summaries. In this particular case, uh, starting to push the experiences to those patients at the appropriate time had resulted in quite an uptick, upwards of nearly 70% of the population actually leveraging their mobile phones to access uh, their care summaries, to receive their discharge instructions, and to also respond at bedside to patient experience questionnaires, which thereby improve their HCAP scores downstream. So again, these types of organizations years ago set out on a path to establish a very discreet digital front door set of experiences. But in doing so, they were very mindful of what are the metrics that we need to focus on, what do we need to capture, and what are the use cases that we need to introduce and what modality to the patient population that drives those particular metrics and areas of impact. And here, they're starting to reap the benefits, more often than not, across their entire patient population uh, and in how they, they improve acquisition and how they improve clinical outcome. With that being said, I will stop here for our presentation and hopefully I've offered up uh, quite a bit of information on just implementation strategies, execution, what we're seeing in the market. I'll stop here and just open it up to questions that uh, we can respond to. Thank you, Noel. Appreciate that fantastic presentation. And we will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard. And we'll try to get through as many as we can. We've had a few great questions come in already. And we'll go ahead and get started with this one. The attendee says, so you emphasize using smartphones to meet consumer needs, but today 27 million seniors, 65 and over, who are major users of healthcare don't own smartphones, nor do some 30 million adults who earn less than 50K a year. Uh, more of a comment here, but I think uh, the comment sort of begs the question, how does this strategy go about reaching these types of patients? No, I think it's a super question, one we get quite frequently. Earlier in my presentation, one of the key things that I had made mention is that the, the adoption and acceleration of usage of and um, ownership of uh, smartphones is accelerating, although not completely there. That's a known fact, and we're very aware of that. From our perspective, as I mentioned earlier, it is still very relevant to have an omni-channel set of experiences. Um, you have to be able to introduce, uh, you know, not just the ability to do things like text, web app, mobile app, but also still introduce legacy models around automated voice message, as well as things like email. Uh, we find that having a platform approach that identifies the best methodology this patient will actually become compliant to that call to action is really the most successful way to introduce that particular strategy. So without a doubt, uh, we also agree that you, know, you have to be able to cater to a variety of populations. But what we are finding, and I actually Nicholas Children's is a really great example of this, where 72% of their population is Medicaid. Uh, a vast majority of them don't own a computer, uh, but everybody has a cell phone in that scenario. So it really is about identifying 
uh, how it how will this particular population uh, respond? How do we meet them in that particular uh, interaction? But then how do I start to also move them towards the methodology that we as an organization would like to continue interacting with? It, it is a it is a very nuanced solution. And so you have to be mindful of, of those particular factors. Thank you, Noel. That was super helpful. Uh, and we'll move to this next question here. So uh, this attendee says this should be a part of a population health program and wants to know more about price and quality transparency and how that all works out. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, first off, let me say that we absolutely agree. Um, at the end of the day, what we have found is that a lot of the front door strategies and a lot of the patient engagement strategies have been limited, quite frankly, to sort of your traditional CRM-based interactions. Uh, we, we philosophically disagree. Uh, our belief is that uh, this patient engagement in general is part of a much broader strategy than just patient access or driving patients in the door, but has to be completely uh, intertwined with care management experiences and population health experiences as well. When you really zoom out from just the technology in and of itself, it is about content, call to action, and ability to perform the call to action. From our perspective, in a population health view, if we've identified that, for example, this patient is due for a follow-up visit 24 hours post-discharge with a primary care physician, I want to be able to offer a pathway for that patient to coordinate and schedule an appointment with that primary care or help them find one on file. And one that, to your exact point, around price transparency or what have you, even if it's around quality, one that, that they feel is relevant for their own particular persona and, their, and them as an individual. So without a doubt, I think that what you'll find is that more of these experiences will become much more holistic and it will be more than just delivering your traditional sort of relationship management type of content and start to move towards much more care management population health type strategies. Thank you, Noel. And we've had a bunch of great questions coming in. I uh, really appreciate all the engagement from attendees. And this next attendee asks, um, so you accept care summaries as being adequate, but why not push complete notes to PT so he or she can correct errors and their docs can use the PT's device to coordinate care? Yeah, I, I would 100% agree. In fact, uh, this is, so let me, uh, let me uh, approach it from two perspectives. When it comes to things like care summaries, uh, I think there is a part one of this where it's important for us to ensure that we introduce care summary delivery to the patient population and the individual at the appropriate point in time, whether that is immediately post-service of that particular uh, situation and or if an update has been made to that particular care summary from, an, from a relevant clinician that is attributed or associated to that particular patient's care team. Without a doubt, I think that's a, a, a vital and very important strategy that has to get introduced. But secondarily and above and beyond that, we also need to be able to give those particular patients ownership and an ability to also uh, deliver that themselves uh, directly to downstream providers. What we find is that it, it's not always that that particular uh, provider organization is going to be associated uh, with an organization within the same network. The patient has choice at the end of the day. So you still have to be able to provide the ability for the patient to not just review their clinical care summary, but also make the decision as to where that needs to go downstream uh, after that particular visit and allow them to navigate uh, to that next level of care or provide visibility to the remaining individuals within the care team. I think we're starting to see some elements of this also be introduced uh, along the clinician side uh, down in Florida. Um, so if you are in the Florida market, you're probably f familiar with uh, House Bill 843 uh, that just recently got passed, where it does require uh, the delivery of the clinical care summary to all patients, requires also the ability to notify downstream physicians of uh, an admission 
uh, of the patient and a discharge of the patient and the care summary of the patient. So we are seeing regulatory-wise that that is also becoming a, a requirement uh, and an ability to, um, to create that visibility across all clinicians within the care team. Excellent. Thank you, Noel. And the next question here uh, has to do with the Medicare Medicaid populations. Again, we've, we've discussed a bit about this. Um, mm -hmm. So the attendee asks, how has this text and push-based model worked on the Medicare and Medicaid population? Additionally, what about patients that speak different languages? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first off, I think from a, a languages perspective, it is vital that we try to capture uh, the, uh, the, uh, the per highest percent of the population as it relates to language. I mean, from our perspective, when it comes to our platform, we automatically have defaulted our platform to a very specific set of languages, English, Spanish, so on and so forth, based on what we know domestically. Uh, and it is going to be relevant because at the end of the day, that's the best way that we know they were there, those patients are willing to communicate. So you do need to be thinking about and accommodating for those particular populations. With all that being said, when it comes to the Medicare and Medicaid population, uh, one of the one of the things that we constantly get is, you know, are, are those particular populations really going to adopt these types of technologies? Our data and our statistics over the last over 15 million patients right now have identified that, um, in particular, our highest utilizers are actually between the ages of roughly 65 and 74 um, right now. Now, it's, it's for a couple of reasons. Number one, they are the highest utilizers of care at this moment, but more importantly, I think that there was, um, in the past, um, probably uh, an assumption that was made that these particular populations really aren't accustomed to text messaging or leveraging smartphones. I think what we're finding is that, that that's, not, that's not necessarily the case. Um, my own grandmother still Skypes me today, um, and she receives text messages and sends me and my, my children uh, text messages. Uh, whenever she needs to. It is a methodology by which that particular population has found uh, to be very useful and very um, meaningful to their own lives. And so in our population, the ones that we serve, we're finding that that particular population is becoming a very highly utilized population. Now, on the Medicaid side, uh, also very similar. Um, we've found that uh, on the Medicaid population, they are more willing to uh, leverage their own mobile phones and their own mobile devices uh, in order to engage uh, with the population. Again, very similar to what I was saying before with, uh, with Nicholas Children's, um, where a high percentage of that population, quite frankly, doesn't have the income to afford a traditional computer. Uh, and so you can't expect them to go to a traditional patient portal if they don't have a mechanism to do that. But every one of them has a phone. And that's a traditional way that, they're, that they are willing to actually engage with the population. That isn't the panacea, and I'm not suggesting that by any means. But it is a, it is a known uh, opportunity that we as organizations can begin to take advantage of uh, as we look into our, some of our strategies. Let us not forget that an omni-channel set of experiences is still relevant, and our ability to capture what is the best methodology that patient would like to be communicated with is still a very important requirement in the development of that front door strategy. Thank you, Noel. Some really great insights there. And since we are at the top of the hour now, this will be our last question. Uh, so this attendee wonders, how do you measure ROI? Is it based on incremental improvement versus ex existing systems, or is it based on investment versus total improvement? That's a super question and um, highly nuanced, just to, just to say. Um, from, from our perspective, when we have always looked at return on investment, it's in a couple of different buckets. Um, to your exact point, um, usually we start to look at things like cost reduction, right? In a point-based type of uh, strategy, oftentimes you have multiple cost structures that you're having to manage. Uh, not just from your traditional license or subscription uh, models, but you also having to having to manage uh, operational cost, uh, interface cost, technology cost associated with multiple different technologies. Um, so there, in the consolidation effort, 
there is an immediate return that most organizations will garner just from that move or that, that uh, strategic decision. But above and beyond that, uh, what you'll find is that return on investment can be easily measured across very discrete use cases and then compared against existing models. Case in point, uh, you know, we may find that, um, you know, uh, our current utilization of 24-hour post-discharge, which is done manually today by a bank of nurses, uh, only yields a 10% uh, um, utilization by the population, 10% hit rate, which on average is, is what you typically start to see is a 10 to 15% hit rate. But if uh, when we start introducing a technology that um, uh, does automated outreach to the population and assessment capabilities that yields 50 to 60% utilization um, of the technology, and an ability for us to establish intervention points that prevent readmission, then you can very quickly point to and identify the, how that is being utilized and the return on investment that is being generated from that discrete use case. I say it's nuanced because every single interaction you introduce along the journey should, again, have a very specific return on investment or, uh, or a discrete value back to your particular organization. And that's how we have always looked at that return on, on investment for an organization. It can't be just about, I want to engage patients. It has to be, what are, what are the use cases and interactions that will be meaningful and mutual between patient and healthcare organization? Thanks for really dissecting that one for us, Noel. Um, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave our attendees with today? Well, I just want to say thank you again for uh, the opportunity for uh, to, to work with you guys and talk with you guys here today. Hopefully, you found a lot of this information helpful. Um, if you'd like to learn more, um, it, my contact information is obviously available, and, or please visit us at, uh, at www.allscripts.com. Thank you again, and uh, I look forward to working with all of you here in the near future. So that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank Noel for his excellent presentation and all scripts for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.